Hi, this is Danielle with Hollywood Breakthrough, and I'm here with Zach Piper. He is a independent producer, director, sound editor. He actually did 63 Boycott that's out everywhere is life itself, but he also worked on The Interrupters. Zach, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yes, of course. Thanks for having me. Wow. You know, you have a span of work you've done. You work a lot with Mr. Steve James. The yes, I do. I love that film. And um, can you tell me a little bit how you got started? You're from the UK, right? Well, I was born there on an Air Force base, but I was really, I was really raised here uh, in the U.S., downstate Illinois. Um, but I, I got started with the Interrupters back in 2009, just as uh, you know, we were still in pre- pre-production. But I'd worked with Steve James, the director, on uh, a couple other films actually in the past. But right, right before the Interrupters began, we had just I just finished uh, helping produce a film with him called At the Death House Door. And so we spent a lot of time together uh, in production on that and, you know, in post and, and then, you know, at some of the film festivals and things. And, and we, we worked together really well. And, and when this, the Interrupters film started to become a reality, he asked me if I, you know, wanted to be along as a sound person, but also as uh, a co-producer and, you know, I obviously respect his work. And so it was, you know, of course, it was a, a great opportunity and, and just an amazing experience to be able to work on the film. And we shot for about a year and a half very uh, regularly. We were we were pretty much on call as the interrupters themselves were. Um, and, you know, the first few months, maybe four or five months, even it was kind of slow going. But once the phone calls started to come from the interrupters, they came very often and uh you know so we really got an appreciation of those kind of schedules that they keep but uh it was a great experience and you know the overall and 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 in every way the interrupters was a great film it had a lot of great content i love the film so much because it really talked about some of the violence in chicago and i was surprised how he went in there and be able to talk to the organizations and the groups out there trying to figure out a way to resolve some of the issues in Chicago. Tell me more and more about your take on not just that film, but the work you have done so far. Yeah, well, the, I mean, The Interrupters was a very, you know, special film uh, to work on. And it was a, a, a process in order to get, you know, the footage that we got. It wasn't, you know, sort of a, an overnight thing to get some of that footage. It was a lot of time put in with the people in the organization, but also the interrupters themselves to, to gain the trust that we needed and to really sort of let people understand what it was that we were trying to do. So there was a lot, you know, of hours put in to, to try to kind of break through so we could get some of the footage that we were, you know, sort of setting out to get uh, to make the film. One of the things about the, the film was, you know, we was filmed over the course of just over a year and we really got an appreciation of the schedules of the interrupters because we sort of were on call with them, you know, 24 seven and not that we were going out at all hours, but we, you know, it became pretty close uh, to that sometimes. And, and uh, we really got an appreciation for the work that they, that they did and the sacrifices that they made personally. And, you know, they have like Amina, for instance, and Kobe both had, uh, families, uh, you know, spouses and children. And so it was a, you know, to see their commitment was inspiring and it made it, you know, easier for, uh, and, and just was a great motivation to, uh, to continue and to finish the film. Now the film you did recently that got a lot of acclaim, a lot of awards is the Roger Ebert film life itself won the critics choice award for a documentary, best documentary, and I just love that film so much. It captured a lot of different people that love Roger. Based in Chicago, a lot of the work was um, shot in Chicago. How is that? You won every award that's out there from Best Documentary, the Golden Tomato, from the National Board of Review, African American Film Critics, basically every film review award out there. And unfortunately, you guys did not get the Oscar nomination. That kind of crushed me a great deal. But, um, <laughs> A thousand people are talking about this all over the on the internet, um, TV, newspapers. Tell me how you guys got started with that on your part when you produced that film with uh, Mr. Steve James. Sure. Uh, you know, um, 
uh, Steve and I had lunch uh, at some point uh, in the summer or spring of 2012, and where he first talked about the project with me. But I know before that he'd been working with uh, Garrett Bash, uh, the producer, another producer on the film who is based in LA, and um, and Garrett and his his producing partner Steve Zalian, who ended up being an ex executive producer on this film, they had read Roger's memoir, and they decided they they thought this would be a great this may be a great documentary and they approached Roger about it um, I, I think Roger was you know kind of skeptical a little unsure at first but I think you know he he agreed to to let them explore the idea and they brought Steve in to direct um, and then Steve brought me in uh, as sort of like the you know producing another producer a local uh, producer in December 2013 or excuse me December 2012 we began filming and um, we we sort of kind of just jumped right in and I'd say in the first month of December we mainly just filmed with Roger and at that point Roger had already been uh, in fact the very first day we met with Roger he had just gotten back from the hospital where uh, they hadn't diagnosed it yet but he had he had uh, fractured his uh, femur bone his hip uh, I guess actually and you know that sort of that's all documented in the film, but we kind of jump right in after that. When we, we weren't able to get some of the footage we wanted right away with Roger and Chaz, we kind of set our, our sights on doing a lot of interviews. So month of January, February of 2013, we were doing lots of interviews. And, uh, of course, then, you know, Roger's health was in decline. And, um, and you know, he ended up passing away in April. Um, so that's sort of like the, the – which, which, which really kind of derailed – the plans for the film at that moment. And, it, you know, the film really ended up taking a completely different shape from what had you gone back and asked in the fall of 2012, what the film would look like. It looks very different than, um, than that original idea, I think. And, and so, yeah, we spent the rest of the year cutting and doing some more interviews. And, and then we premiered 2014 at Sundance and it's been, you know, it's been a, a really amazing uh, past year with, as you said, some of the recognition that the film's got and, and um, some of the just, it's been really rewarding to see the film with audiences and to see how people respond to the film, but really, you know, they're, they're also responding to Roger. And one of the great, um, the great little things that happens with this film and um, in some of the times when I've gone out with the film is you meet people who come to you and say, oh, I just have to tell you this one thing about Roger, you know, he sent me this email one time or one time, he, you know, he read something I wrote and he sent me a note or I, I, I emailed him something and he responded, you know, an hour later. Uh, uh, it was always these great stories of Roger's generosity and Roger's, you could just get the sense that it was obvious, you know, to us who made the film, how much Roger loved life and he loved people. But it was just so great to see all these different people that had these Roger Ebert stories that clearly were really meaningful to them. And, you know, uh, something that they weren't going to forget. And anyway, it was it was great to hear all of those, and just a great experience overall to work on the film. I thought great that uh, some of the celebrities came on, other critics came on the film as well. Ava, she was a little girl when she met Roger Ebert. I thought that was really great that she they had a picture mm. of her, and then she talked about it, and she came growing up to being a director herself. Yeah. Well, I think you know, Ava had. Uh, Roger had reviewed her film, uh, her first film, and after, I think Ava sent a note, uh, I could have this story wrong, but I believe Ava sent Roger a note, you know, saying thank you, uh, because it was a really favorable review, and she, as she said in the film, she really felt like Roger got it, you know, um, really got her film, and was able to articulate sort of what she was trying to accomplish with it, and so I think she may have sent a note of thank you, of thanks, and, and along with it, the photo of her with Roger, when she was just you know, a kid. And yeah, I love that story. It's a great story. And it's got a great ending too, with how Roger then turns that into a blog post about his own aunt, who his own aunt, who also shared the love of film with him. And yeah, it's a great story. And Ava was, you know, wonderful, uh, a wonderful interview and, you know, just very gracious with her time. And, and um, in fact, I think she was, she was one of the final interviews we did for the film. You know, she's LA based. So we had, she was coming, we were waiting for her to come back through the Midwest and we, um, we sat down with her at, uh, we actually filmed that interview at the, uh, 
the cinema at uh, University of Indiana. Yeah, that was a, a really important part of the film, definitely. In this case, people don't know who Ava is, the director of film, Zelma, came out recently as well this year. Mm -hmm. So that's great that she was actually took part in your film as well. Yes, yes, uh, definitely. And, and um, I, I don't, I'm not sure when Zelma was filmed, but we, I think our interview with her was in the summer of 2013. So um been preparing for it at that time. But um, yeah, definitely. She's a, a, a you know fantastic filmmaker and, and person. And um, she was a really important part of the film. Now, how did you get started doing producing and working in film? Well, you know, my since I was, uh, you know, a young person, I was always really interested in documentary filmmaking. And I, you know, probably, I mean, definitely going back into high school. And I, I studied film in college and was extremely fortunate that right after college, right out of college, I had an internship at Cartemquin Films here in Chicago, which is the production company that made uh, Life Itself, The Interrupters. But before that, it, it was the production company where Steve you know, directed Hoop Dreams uh, and the, the, they produced Hoop Dreams and supported that film, the duration of production. So. You know, I went there about 15 years ago. Uh, Hoop Dreams was just about, you know, six years old at the time. So it was still, you know, a uh, pretty, pretty recent film. I started as an intern and I, I sort of, it's a small organization. There's some amazing, truly amazing filmmakers. And uh, there are, you know, many who are, you know, they're, they're known in the, in the documentary world, but they should be known even further, I mean, they're Gordon Quinn, uh, uh, for one, um, who actually founded the organization back in 1966. So think about their 49 years. They've been 49 years making social issue based or oriented uh, documentary films out of Chicago. Wow. Um, so I was extremely fortunate to be there. I had, you know, uh, I was eventually hired within less than a year after starting my internship. I think I did some freelance stuff around town and with Cartemplin. And um, I just was very lucky and I kind of worked my way in a lot of different areas in, in post-production and then in production, doing a little bit of shooting, you know, just found that there were more opportunities for me to go out and do sound, uh, be the sound person. And, and you know, there's another uh, founder at Cartemplin named Jerry Blumenthal, who um, just recently passed away. And, and he was also, you know, really amazing uh, filmmaker, really influential to me, just as a, you know, even as a person, but he sort of, I always sort of looked at it like modeling after him a little bit because he was also a location sound person who did a lot of producing and, and directing. And when he worked with Gordon, his, you know, his partner on all these different films uh, throughout the decades, uh, Gordon would always shoot, Jerry would always do sound. And, you know, they would either co-direct or one would direct, one would produce, but they always played those other roles, you know, and actually it serves a crew very well because, I mean, think about, the, take The Interrupters, for instance. If we had, you know, Steve shot that film and he directed it and I, you know, was a co-producer on it and I did sound. So we, each, we were each playing dual roles, you know, and Alex, Alex was there um, as a producer and it was the three of us. And that was the perfect size crew. You know, we didn't, had we gone bigger, um, it would have been it would have been more difficult really to get to get some of the access because then we're we're just we're just traveling a little too heavy at that point you know, there were some times where it was only two people sometimes there was only one person you know depending we would always kind of feel that out and and take the cues from the interrupters but also use our own judgment you know uh, that sometimes it just wasn't practical or wasn't wise to to send all three of us uh, at a certain point but so that that's sort of how i got into it you know i just kind of because it's a small organization, which is now growing, it's it's truly at this point, it's at the it's largest it's ever been. I think there's something like 12 staff members, and you know there's a whole community of of associates, and they're all freelance producers, directors, which is probably you know dozens of people. 15 years ago, there was a staff of maybe three, and you know, and now they're just making all these films. They've got so many in the pipeline, but that's kind of how I, I sort of work my way up into it. Um, just got really involved in, which is what I loved getting, instead of working on many different projects, I'd be working on a single project and just completely kind of immersed in it. Like with Interrupters, there was, 
I I can't say I did anything else for two and a half years or two wow. years at least besides work on that film every day. Wow. You know, and and I love that. I think that's it was, for me that's a great that's a perfect fit. You know, it's not always practical. I mean, that was extremely fortunate because you know there was uh, it wasn't always easy with funding, but we did we were able to fund that film obviously com- uh, to completion and and you know to pay ourselves and I. Uh, Realize it then, but I definitely realize it now how, how fortunate, how, you know, that's just, you're so lucky to be able to do that. And, um, and it, you know, getting, raising money for any film, even, you know, even for someone, uh, an established production company like Cortemquin or established filmmakers, I think is always difficult. Um, but at any rate, going back to this, my, that, that's sort of the trajectory of my career. And, you know, now I'm, you know, producing films. I'm still doing, you know, sound on the shoots. I love doing it. It's fun. It's a great way to be, to have something to do when you're out in the field. I love being out in the field. The films you've done. My question is basically how hard or difficult is it for you to kind of, you know, the motivation to keep going because even though you love it so much, Mm -hmm. it might be difficult to like be a producer and try to find funding. How hard would that would be to keep kind of knocking on doors and and getting funding. How yeah. difficult is all that? I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but I, I think that, you know, uh, if you have a project that you believe in and you, I mean, that's motivation. And, you know, also there's a practical motivation that, you know, you need to pay the bills. And, but, but really, truly even more so, I mean, that's, no one gets rich uh, in this industry. I'm talking on the documentary side of things. I mean, maybe there are a couple people or a few people, but I, you know, I, I don't even think they would necessarily consider themselves th- that way. I think it's, it's, you know, people who make documentaries, I think, are, are kind of cut from a different cloth. And, you know, you, I think you'll often find, we talk to someone who's made a film, that they will believe so strongly and passionately in the film and in what they've, they're doing. That's what motivates, I think, you know, you're always going to, even if you have fun, you're always going to, you're going to find times where, where you're discouraged during production, during post, you know, there's going to be, there's all, all kinds of things that, where you can even be questioning, you know, what, what are we doing? Is it, are we even, is this film, does it even make sense? Is it even, but, you know, I, I think having, uh, being able to step back and realize that, you know, that's part of the process. And, you know, I think the point I was trying to make a second ago is that I think that, you know, documentary filmmakers are, kind of, you know, motivated by the issues or motivated by uh, this, uh, this purpose of trying to, uh, you know, not just make a film, but maybe somehow, hopefully, you know, make something that could be used as a tool to, you know, f- for change or, or, or something like that. I mean, in the best case scenario. So we don't let the, uh, the no letters uh, get us down. <laughs> Your upcoming film is is called 63 Boycott. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, 63 Boycott film, it's actually been uh, slowly in production for a few years. Gordon Quinn, the founder of Quartem Quinn, back in 1963 when he was still an undergrad student at University of Chicago, he was in a film club with some other people, and um, they had some film stock uh, left over from some project they had done. Uh, at, the, at the same time, there was sort of a... Uh, some movement within the Chicago public school system to in protest of the, at the time, uh, racist superintendent of schools who was over, they were sort of gerrymandering the school district so that they were trying to keep white schools white, black schools black, and to the point where black schools will become so overcrowded that they were dumping trailers in the, or putting trailers in the parking lots of the schools and making those mobile classrooms where maybe there'd be a, a class or a school, you know, half a mile away that had really small class sizes. So it was definitely, you know, a racial thing. And at any rate, they felt there were some these amazing actions uh, at the time in 1963. Um, some of the, at the time, largest um, uh, protests uh, in, you know, outside of the South uh, in terms, you know, civil rights protests. And, and Gordon, along with some of his uh, fellow students, they went out and filmed these, uh, one this one day in particular, they filmed a this the largest of the protests uh, citywide. I mean, there were whole schools that were empty. There were no students or faculty. Everyone was protesting, or they were they were either protesting or they were staying home in protest. 
at any rate, we uh, have taken this footage, we had it transferred, and we're intercutting it with uh, some new interviews of people who were participated in the boy, boycott of students, some people who are still organizers, who are still uh, living, it's amazing, and kind of looking back at sort of like what the role was of this uh, movement, not just in the civil rights movement, but also what the legacy of this action, of these actions, these protests in the Chicago public school system today. And uh, so that it's, a, it's going to be a short film, though. So th that's one thing. There's a few other projects that are we're sort of trying to develop. But, um, but yeah, that's an exciting one. And and uh, I hope I hope that this will be the year where we uh, were able to release it. And what was the other film for that one? Um, well, there's a couple other ones. I mean, some are so early that they're they're actually hard to talk about. But you know, I am working with Steve James on another uh, project, which will probably we're not quite sure how where it's going to be. He he was in production with a number of other folks, producers, and and other people um, for the last few years. And and the project has sort of changed its nature a little bit. It's not going to necessarily just be a feature documentary. Uh, but I think it's going to be, it may be a, a, just a series of short documentaries that some of which will you know, definitely be available online. And that project is called Generation Food, which tracks uh, stories really around the world uh, and some in the U.S., but there's all corners really of the globe of people finding creative and, you know, interesting solutions to different, you know, uh, questions around sustainability uh, with food and, and, you know, just general health. So that's an exciting project that this, I think, year will be the year where a lot, there's been a lot of production already, but I think in particular this year, there'll be uh, a big step up. So that's another exciting project. What would you tell someone who's trying to get into the documentary film? Because everyone says, you know, being into the film industry, Hollywood basic is a business. What do you think some things that you can kind of, a couple of things you can give to people or tell people that would help them mm. on their road doing films. Yeah, well, you know, one thing, one thing I think is is very important, and I feel like it's it's not it's not the, an easy necessarily thing to to be able to get hooked into, but um, it was really really important for my own development and you know continued development. But is having uh, some kind of mentor relationship with someone or some people who have, you know, experience. I think that is really, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's maybe not crucial for every single person, but I, I do feel like there's no downside to it. And not only can you learn a lot, but through, you know, such a relationship, you can, you know, make other connections with other filmmakers because I think, you know, filmmaking is a very collaborative process. And I think I've been complete, I've been so fortunate that I've always been around other filmmakers, you know, from, cause for some point that's, it's all, it's such a community there. And I was, you know, from, from the day I walked in the door there 15 years ago, I've never, I've always been around other filmmakers, but I, you know, in talking with other filmmakers who don't have that, I know it's really hard. So I think finding, you know, if you can't find if you're not able to get in a relationship, like a mentor in type of relationship, I think it's important to find a community, you know, because like we were talking about earlier, there are, there are tough times and it's not just fundraising. It's while you're filming and there's, you know, it's, there's ups and downs and, and having other people who have gone through it or who are going through it or who maybe have gone through it for, you know, decades around that you can talk to and get advice from, I think it's invaluable. And, you know, you, you, it, it, it accelerates the pace at which you are, you know, getting experience yourself because you're kind of getting it, you're, you're learning from other people's experience. So I think that's really important um, in terms of like practical things to, to break into the business. I don't, it's really, I mean, my, I can't say enough. I, I know I've said it a couple times already, but I really can't say enough how fortunate I was to get in in the way I did through interning. And uh, at the time, it was seemed like it was kind of rare, at least at Cartemplin. But these days, um, there are you know there are a really there's a really high number of people in the orbit of that organization who started out as interns now, and you know including staff members, other filmmakers. It just it's uh, you know if, if if you're in listening and you're in the Chicago area uh, or
or if you're mobile and can move to Chicago, an internship at Kartemkin will be, you know, a dynamite move if you're able to, to fling that. If you're not, you know, I think, you know, there are other organizations. I think you have to sort of like do research and, and find other filmmakers. Sometimes I might may mean volunteering and, and not being paid. Other times, you know, people may choose a different route and just go and make a film. And that's certainly, there's a lot of people that do that too. And, uh, but I think along the way you, you do, you do get, uh, you just need to find that community and, 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 and get that support. Are you using any particular tools or camera right now? That's kind of a hot thing for you right now. You know, the camera that a lot of people are using now is the C300, the C100. We actually shot the life itself film with the C300 camera. And there's, you know, I'm not uh, an expert, uh, an expert on the cameras, but I, the, my understanding is the only difference between the C100 and C300, a few little extra bells and whistles, which we did want to, you know, take advantage of. You know, there's a couple sequences in Life Itself that are in slow motion, and those were actually shot in slow motion. Right? Because there's a huge difference between the look of what a camera can do in film, because you can you can over crank it, which means that you're shooting extra frames, you know, and then you slow that down to 30 frames, or I guess in this case, we 24 frames. You slow down to 24 frames, and then it just plays at like half speed, you know, half real time speed. But it's amazing looking, and you compare that to a motion effect you might put on the same clip in with your editing program, and your computer's gonna, you know, it's just it's not gonna look the same. It's not gonna be as fluid and as graceful. Um, so that was important to us. So you know, it's a little, it's extra cost, it's considerable extra cost to get that camera, but it's important to us. Uh, but a lot of doc makers uh, are using the C100, which is basically the same camera body with just a few extra, with a few features missing. But that's really the camera that lots of people are using right now. Now, I want to tell you, a congratulations again on the Critics' Choice Award. I'm not, I'm not sure why the Oscar nomination didn't happen for you guys. Do you have any idea? Mm-hmm. You, have you guys kind of thought about it, talked about it? I'm sure you probably talked about it, but... Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it and we've thought about it. And, you know, I, we don't have, I mean, there's really no theories other than there were five other films that, you know, the documentary branch of the Academy thought were, were better or more deserving. I mean, that's, that's about as far as I, I can get into any kind of theory because I, I don't, you know, I think the documentary branch is something like two, Maybe it's like 300 people, 250 people. Um, I mean, it's, 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 who knows? I mean, uh, it was, and uh, Steve said somewhere that where he, you know, he wasn't shocked, but he was surprised. Um, you know, after, honestly, it was a little, you know, a little of both for me just because, you know, we had a year where, and especially the last few months where it was being talked about so much is almost like a sure thing. And even though I would, you know, um, of course it's, it's not a sure thing, but you know, I guess you, you get your hopes up. I got, I guess, I guess I got my hopes up a little bit, but you know, um, but you know, life goes on and, and, you know, our congratulations to the other films and it would be an exciting year. And, and it's been an amazing run for citizen four with all of their, uh, accolades and attention and well-deserved, uh, you know, collected over the past month. So, so yeah. And I just want to say again, thank you so much for coming on the show. The work you've done is amazing. Definitely congratulations to everything you did. Interrupters, Life Itself, both those films. I really love Interrupters. Um, oh, wow. Time. But uh, Life Itself, it was just, it was amazing to watch that and oh. see... Well, that's really um, nice. Roger in a different you. light. So that was really wonderful. Well, yeah, thank you, Danielle. I mean, it was a pleasure to be on your show, and I really I appreciate um, I appreciate all the kind words. Of